So welcome. Um, I know we have Cynthia here, although she's not yet appeared on the screen. And I know we have Alex here. Um, there's Alex. Um, my name is Larry Lessig. I'm so grateful to everyone who um, has participated in these deliberations today. And you've put together a wonderful list of questions that we will now present to our experts. Um, uh, first, let me introduce myself. I'm a law professor from Harvard. I've kind of made it my professional career to cause trouble in the context of the Electoral College. Um, and so I continue to be eager to see what trouble we can cause. These others on the call have been expert, as you'll see, in different aspects of the questions you've uh, addressed. So let me just go from the very top here. Um, Alex Kesar um, has written maybe the most interesting book now that there is, that just came out, uh, a book uh, titled, um, Why Do We Still Have the Electoral College? Um, and uh, it's an extraordinary historical account um, of the institution and its um, continued existence. He's the Sterling Professor of History and Social Policy at the Kennedy School at Harvard University. Um, and, uh, and he's gonna provide a general perspective on where we are and how we got here. Cynthia uh, Terrell is the founder and executive director of Represent Women and the founder of Fair Vote, which has been um, an which is an organization that's been advocating electoral reform in lots of contexts, in particular in the context of ranked choice voting, but they've also been heavily involved in the questions around the Electoral College. Uh, Dave Capel is the research director of the Independence Institute, an adjunct scholar at the Cato Institute, and an adjunct professor of advanced constitutional law at Denver University's Storm College of Law. And he's written scholarly articles on the constitutionality of a national popular vote. Um, Eileen uh, Reevy is the national grassroots director of National Popular Vote, which is a nonprofit dedicated to the promotion of the National Popular Vote Interstate Compact. And Norm Williams is the Ken and Claudia Peterson Professor of Law at Wilmette University College of Law and the director of the Wilmette Center for Constitutional Government. Um, in addition to teaching constitutional election law, he's authored many scholarly articles on the constitutionality of the Electoral College reform. This is a wonderful panel that is diverse uh, in the sense that um, some support reform and some are more skeptical um, of reform, at least under the rules of the existing Electoral College. So we wanna make sure we try to get a balanced perspective between them on the uh, many, many questions which you've asked. So we've tried to pull together some that are representative and we're gonna move through the three topics that you deliberated on and pull out some of the questions from each. Um, and if we move through these very quickly, then we'll get through a lot of these questions. So the basic format of the way we'll present it is I'll read a question and then I'll throw it to someone on the panel and then other people on the panel are actively encouraged to jump in and disagree or add more or help, um, uh, help everyone see the context. Okay, so the first proposal we considered or you considered is um, whether is the national popular vote question whether we should elect the president by a national popular vote. And that topic generated lots of specific questions. So here's the first we'll consider. Would a national popular vote lead to federal neglect of rural or less populous area, uh, areas? Um, uh, okay, so um, um, there's a lot of people here who could address that, but let me, let me just start with Eileen. Eileen, what, how do you think about the, rural versus um, urban issue that gets triggered by the question of the national popular vote? Yeah, thanks, Larry. So it's a common question because people think that those areas might be neglected. But if you look at the numbers, if you look at the 2010 census data, because we the 2020 numbers aren't quite yet specific enough to make this comparison. But if you look at 2010, 19% of Americans live in what is defined as rural America by the Census Bureau. It just so happens that 19% of Americans is also the same amount of people that live in America's 100 largest cities, which goes all the way down to Spokane, Washington on that list. So really, 
you're not going to have the rural areas be ignored any more than you're going to have the people in the hundred largest cities be ignored. Because in reality, people are all across this country. And we have other parts of our government that are meant to give equal suffrage to the states, which is what I think what sometimes people think about when they think about more rural areas. And every voice uh, every state does have an equal voice in our, our legislature through the U.S. Senate. So there's other avenues for those places to have equal representation as well. Okay, uh, Alex, did you want to add something to that? Wait, you're muted, Alex. Sorry. Um, the one thing I would add to that is that I, I, I think it's also a little misleading to equate the small states with rural areas. The small states might lose um, some, you know, some marginal uh, advantage there, although I think it's more than made up by the things that Eileen has mentioned. But, you know, Rhode Island is a very small state um, and it's a very urban state. Uh, and, you know, I think, I think that has to be kept in mind as well. Okay, Norm or David, did you have a, did you want to add something to this? David. Well, I got to say, if, uh, if this proposal is going to lead to the federal and the government neglecting and ignoring uh, rural America, so, uh, sign me up, because uh, a lot of what goes wrong in this country is uh, a bunch of people in Washington, D.C., uh, who think they uh, know more than everybody else in the rest of the country collectively and try to micromanage people's lives from, uh, from very afar on, on matters that should be uh, left to state and local government. Um, I don't think it will lead to neglect. I think it'll lead to more centralization of power, a shift of power uh, from rural areas uh, to the uh, mass urban areas like Los Angeles and, and New York City uh, with decision making made collectively by uh, bodies that are, are on the whole quite out of touch uh, with rural life. It's definitely true that small town, that not every small state is rural, Delaware, Rhode Island, and, and Hawaii, uh, having most of their populations in urban areas. Uh, but the Electoral College on a whole uh, reflects our principle that we are not a pure democracy of just people voting and you count up the people. There are other interests and communities that come into play. And just like in the olden days when the Electoral College was created so that Massachusetts and Virginia couldn't dominate the rest of the country as the big population states, it still serves that value by giving smaller states of whatever composition some extra protection. Okay, Norman, did you want to add something to that? The one thing that I would add is that uh, uh, rural individuals, just like urban individuals, just like suburban individuals, are largely ignored uh, in our presidential election campaigns. Uh, over 140 million people voted in the presidential election uh, this uh, last November, uh, and a small, small, tiny fraction of those individuals actually uh, ever saw uh, any of the candidates uh, in person. Um, campaigns take place through TV and digital media, not in person any longer. So I, I'm a little skeptical of kind of choosing a particular mechanism for electing a president, be it the Electoral College or the national popular vote, on the supposition that all of a sudden um, uh, most Americans are going to be more engaged or, or not ignored. Um, the reality is we're all ignored. Yeah, um, although one of the issues which I know came up substantially uh, in the fractional pop uh, popular vote context, but throughout, is recognizing that the most powerful units right now in the system for selecting the president are swing states, which are not necessarily rural states, like Pennsylvania has some rural areas and also some urban areas, Michigan too. Um, I, and, uh, but they're not necessarily you know, states like New York or California. When you think about moving to the national popular vote from a swing state democracy, is there any uh, faction, whether it's rural or um, urban, that wins more than another, or is it? Do, you, do we have any way to know what the consequence of that would be? Anybody on that? Yeah, Dave, Norman. Yeah, I, 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 Norman. Uh, we'll um, uh, sure, sure. So uh, the electoral college certainly uh, privileges the swing states. Uh, that's where the candidates spend their money, and we have a lot of data uh, about that in terms of television, advertising, and the rest. Are target uh, those swing states. And certainly moving to a national popular vote 
uh, is going to all of a sudden make Florida, Ohio, Pennsylvania, uh, Michigan um, receive less advertising dollars than they would uh, uh, today. I think moving to the national popular vote would just um, uh, reorder campaigns so that they're focusing on very large media markets, uh, which media markets may include suburban and rural areas, but it's going to be those large media markets, uh, be it San Francisco, Los Angeles, Chicago, New York City, um, Dallas, uh, that are going to be the recipients uh, of the doll of the kind of campaign attention. So uh, again, um, uh, I don't think there's any electoral system out there that's going to kind of guarantee that all Americans get equal attention uh, from the presidential campaigns. Alex? Yeah, I mean, I, I would add two things to that. One, one is that if there's a redistribution of attention, it will be towards where more people are. And that, that's, that strikes me as, uh, you know, as a pretty good thing. Um, I also think it's hazardous to try to predict exactly how campaigns will be run or changed or shifted, um, you know, under a new electoral system. I think, you know, uh, we've done lots of predicting uh, in the past. It hasn't always turned out to be true. In, when Barack Obama was competing in the Democratic primaries in 2008, one of, one of, the, one of the strategic moves that he ma made was to fight for electoral votes, even portions of uh, states, uh, well, I'm sorry, not electoral votes, delegate votes within the party um, in small states. And he built up a considerable advantage by, by focusing on these areas that had relatively uh, few votes. So I, I, don't, I don't think we can safely predict this. Okay, this leads nicely to the next question. I'm sorry, David, do you wanna add something before we move on? I, I think it, it shifts the focus of campaigns away from the swing states and towards the places where people can mine more of the people who already support them. So the Democrat can run up the total in Los Angeles, even though they know they're already gonna win California. And likewise, the likes of George Bush in 2004 would have spent more time running up the, the score in Texas rather than competing in other states. I think the competition of the swing states forces candidates to move to the middle by having to compete in the swing states, which have more diversity uh, than the, the base states uh, for the various candidates, ideological diversity in particular. So I think that tees up nicely the next question. I think Eileen's the perfect person to think about this next question. I think you might wanna to respond a little bit to what we just heard as well. But um, this next question was, what are the benefits with respect to selecting the president and national governance more broadly by making the most important unit, I'm gonna flip this, the individual voter rather than particular states? Like what do we gain by moving to the national popular vote? And, and is it the dynamic that Norman and uh, David were identifying? There's a lot to be gained because it makes every vote equal. And so while we can't say with 100% accuracy that we know exactly how campaigning is going to ha happen under a national popular vote, although we can make some projections that they're going to go everywhere because people are everywhere, we do know that every vote will be equal. So whether you are in uh, Orlando, Florida, or you're in Juneau, Alaska, or downtown Manhattan, your vote will be equal and have an equal opportunity to change the outcome of the presidency. And I think that that's what really is, is something that people should think about and wanting that equality that you can move for college or for a new job and your vote's going to be equal no matter where you live. I mean, you know, the participants today are between 18 and 29. So all of you have spent between 41 and 55% of your life with a president who was not originally supported by even the most amount of voters, let alone a majority. And I think that that has real implications for how the political landscape has been shaped for your entire lives. And so with a national popular vote, we're going to have a system where people can say, my vote is equal. I'm going to be able to feel a little bit more comfortable with the results of the election because I know I had an equal opportunity to weigh in on that and that the, what the most amount of people want is who will end up in the White House. Um, okay, uh, Cynthia, did you wanna jump in on that point too? I know Fair Vote's been thinking a lot about how um, implication across the states would matter. No, I, I agree with what Eileen said, so I'll let it stand there and, and uh, 
get to some other questions because I, I can sense that there are other questions brewing among the participants. Thank There's you. So then I want to ask David and Norman the inverse of this. There's a question that nicely tees that up. Um, so the question is, should all, states have, should all states have the same amount of leverage or power in the system for selecting the president? Um, so Eileen's just identified why it's valuable to have the individual voter as the core unit. Um, is your view that the states should be thought of as the core unit? And if, it, if, if they are, should they also be um, equal in the way that Eileen's identified voters should be equal? Uh, Norman, why don't you start with that? Sure, sure. So, so let me say I agree with much of, of what um, Eileen and I think Cynthia uh, said. I, I kind of probably am the, the raging centrist uh, in this panel uh, in the sense that uh, I support in principle uh, a national popular vote, uh, but I'm very skeptical and have written you know, critically about the national popular vote interstate compact, which I think is a, a very um, a poor way of bringing about a national uh, national popular vote. Um, I also do think that there is some value, not to, to have states as states having a, a, a role in selecting uh, our, our national president, our federal president, but I do think there is some value in having uh, kind of geographic diversity uh, matter in terms of electing our president, that our president not be able to be selected just by running up huge voter margins in a handful of a uh, handful of states, in perhaps one or two regions of the country, and so the the electoral college, or at least having a, a presidential election system that looks at votes not on a nationwide basis but on a state by state basis, does provide some guarantee that our president's going to have to have support in multiple regions of the of the country in order to be elected. Um, and I think that has some value. David. Well, Norman clearly wins the award, not only for moderation, but for best office. Um, <laughs> I, would, I, I would agree with that point. And, you know, I've lived in New York, lived in New York City for several years. The people that <laughs> are very sophisticated, much more so than the average American, about certain things and totally naive, oblivious and clueless about a lot of other things that, you know, 90% of the rest of Americans readily understand. So... I, you can say everybody's vote counts equal, but the Constitution isn't based on the principle of having everybody's vote be equal. The Constitution is based on the principle of getting us the best government that can, in the long term, sustain a free Republican constitutional form of government. And part of that means on a, in a large and diverse nation, you don't want people who can win by just running up the score in the big cities and in places that think they're very diverse, even though they're kind of, they're very monolithic uh, ideologically. And when you force people to com compete in states like Pennsylvania or Ohio, which may be big, or, or smaller states, which may be more balanced politically, you force the, who's going, whoever's going to be the next president to be able to appeal to a wide range uh, of different people, uh, rather than uh, just getting more votes from the people who, like, who are inclined to like him in the first place. Okay, um, Alex, I want you to respond to that, but I'm also move to the next question, which is um, the, the panels didn't really work through the mechanisms of getting to a national popular vote or not. Um, so they haven't deliberated on that. But um, maybe you want to mention like how we could, like what the ways to get to a national popular vote would be, assuming we would have political support for that. But please start by uh, responding as you'd like to what David has just said. Yeah, just, just a quick comment to response to what David said. I, I, th I think it's also important for um, the panelists, you know, to understand there's only so much material we can deliver. But from my perspective, we shouldn't really look at, at the creation of the Electoral College as being grounded particularly in principles. Um, it was a la the institution was a last minute compromise by um, sort of tired people, uh, you know, it accepted the, uh, the legitimacy of the three-fifths clause, among other things. And it did provide, in fact, in the contingent election system, um, a mechanism through which all states did uh, do count equally. And that's probably something with which we all would disagree. Um, even Mitch McConnell wanted to get rid of the contingent election system um, at one point. Um, so the going back to, to the question you, were, you teed up, uh, Larry, um, 
you know, the, the basic and most straightforward uh, but not easy mechanism for moving to a national popular vote would be through a constitutional amendment, uh, which requires the approval of a two thirds vote in both branches of Congress and a three quarters uh, and be ratified by three quarters of the states. Now that's, that's, a, that's a heavy lift, um, but it's also true that we came extremely close to getting there uh, in 1969-70 when the House approved such an amendment uh, by an 83% vote, and it was defeated in the Senate, really only by, only by a filibuster. So uh, that's the basic group. I think then what has appeared, and, and that was for, I think, a long time, the only avenue that people sort of thought was possible. There have, been, there have appeared in the last 15, 20 years, um, you know, other um, mechanisms for trying to do this without amending the Constitution, because it's believed rightly that amending the Constitution is going to be tough. Um, and the most, the most successful or well-known of those is, of course, the Compact, which Eileen could speak about um, uh, more, more ably than I. But I, I think there are, there are several such ideas out there, whether um, they are more satisfactory strategies or solutions than a constitutional amendment, I think is very much open to question. Eileen, do you want to add a little bit about the mechanism of the compact? Yeah. So the National Popular Vote Compact is a way to achieve a national popular vote through the Electoral College. So it's a state-based reform. So when a majority of or excuse me, states with a majority of electoral votes, so that's 270, the number you need to win the presidency, if a group of states with 270 or more electoral votes come together and say, we want our electoral votes to go to the person who wins the national popular vote, they do that by joining the National Popular Vote Compact. And at that time, we then guarantee the presidency to the person who won the national popular vote. And this is a reform that has already been passed by 15 states in DC. And we have 195 electoral votes. So we're actually over 72% of the way there to making this happen. So this is a reform that's well on its way to happening, or at least I certainly hope so. Now, we don't want to get too deep into the weeds about this, but uh, Norman, I know that you've been skeptic. I mean, you're a supporter of the idea, but skeptical of the means. Um, uh, do you want to say just a, a minute about what, what your concern is? Sure, sure. Um, and kind of at the broadest level of generality, uh, my concern about the, the compact is that um, it tries to meld 50 different state electoral mechanisms into one national election. Um, uh, we don't have a truly a national election in the way that France does for its president. Instead, we have uh, 51 different state elections uh, for the president, with each state having its own electoral mechanism, uh, its own uh, set of rules uh, for who can vote, uh, whether a recount uh, will take place. Um, uh, and I just don't think you can kind of, even though we've gotten used to kind of on, on election day, watching the media tabulate um, votes, I don't think uh, that the interstate compact can do what is done in France and actually create a true national, uh, national election. Uh, and the fact you'd have 51 separate state elections still going on um, could be just a real recipe for, for chaos, um, potentially, if, for instance, one of the signatory states pulled out um, you know, California and Oregon are, are signatories of uh, very blue states. Uh, suppose a Republican candidate wins the national popular vote, but loses California and Oregon by huge margins. Are California and Oregon Democrats going to be happy to see their state cast its electoral votes for the Republican uh, candidate? Um, probably not. And there will at least be efforts to withdraw from the compact, which would create, I think, just kind of more chaos uh, and kind of a repeat of 2000 uh, with the US Supreme Court having to decide whether the withdrawal was legitimate or not. So I think there are just a lot of problems with doing it through the compact as opposed to a constitutional amendment, which can create a federal uh, uh, election uh, regime to enable a true national election for the president. Okay, so we're gonna move to the second set of questions. Um, but I'd like to set it up by thinking about it like this. If, we, if in our materials we identify two issues um, that the Electoral College presents, 
And one issue is the one person, one vote issue, which is not everyone's vote is equal in every part of the country. And the second issue is what we could call the swing state issue, that certain states matter more than others because of the winner take all in the states. The national popular vote system, whether a chief or an amendment or if the compact works, solves both of them at the same time. There's no swing state and everybody has the same vote. The second type of solution that we've been, that uh, the, uh, the panel of the groups uh, deliberated on um, is, uh, uh, solves one of those two issues, solves the swing state issue. Uh, and that's the fractional allocation of electoral votes. And the basic idea of the fractional allocation of electoral votes is um, you take the proportion of the vote that a candidate got in a state between the top two candidates in a state and you give them exactly that proportion of electoral votes at a fractional level. So it could be 3.247 votes, um, depending on the percentage in a particular state. And by doing that, what you do is you make it so there's no real swing states anymore. Um, although still the votes of people inside of Wyoming um, have more weight per capita than the votes of people inside of uh, California. Um, so it's not quite as dramatic, but it's um, pretty substantial in that it would pretty importantly make everybody every state relevant in a presidential election, potentially make it so that candidates would be campaigning everyone. Um, okay, so we have a couple questions around here. First one is when it comes to fractional proportional voting, um, how would such a change actually affect the weight of urban and rural voters? This is another version of the first question we had under the national popular vote. Do we have a clearer sense here about um, whether this would um, have a substantial effect on rural and um, uh, versus urban? I don't have an obvious person to ask this question to. So if somebody wants to jump, please jump. Eileen, I think that means you're gonna jump. Um, I would just say, if, I mean, if we have fractional proportional, it, it kind of depends on if we have it in one state or if we have it across. No, let's imagine we have it in every state. Okay, great. Then, um, yeah, I mean, I think you're still going to see candidates campaigning everywhere. I think it would handle it in a similar way to the national popular vote. Um, but I, I think you're going to see instances of elections where you wouldn't have necessarily whoever got the most votes becoming the person who wins, but you would have a little bit more distribution around the states. Alex, you, you've studied this historically. This, this idea is actually not a new idea. It's been around for a long time. Um, uh, what, what, what was the motivation when we first saw it appear? Well, it appeared actually first in the, in the long wake of, uh, of a comparable uh, strategy, which was to choose electors by districts in states. Um, that, that, that was an idea that was actually implemented in a number of states uh, between the 1790s and uh, into the 1830s. Um, and, and there were proposals actually backed by none other than James Madison to make a national, that we should have a national mandate for this, for district elections. The, the, the idea, that idea, uh, retained some support, but diminished in its popularity once at the end of the 19th century, when gerrymandering became a crucial issue. Um, and, you know, and the idea, the idea was, understandably so, was let's not import the problem of gerrymandering, which is bad enough, let's not import it into presidential elections by choosing electors by districts. Um, so proportional was a way of achieving very similar purposes, um, but by av avoiding gerrymandering. And, uh, you know, the closest we ever got, the Senate actually approved the constitutional amendment uh, for uh, for, the, the, for the fractional allocation of electoral votes in 1950. But, and this goes back actually to your question of, you know, who will it help? Will it help rural areas or, or urban areas? Um, the fact is that in the context of 1950, um, where, where actually the, that proposal was backed by a very bizarre coalition of liberal Northern Republicans and racist Southern Democrats. Um, it, it, it appeared that its net effect um, would be to diminish the power of uh, states of, north, of, of large Northern states 
while retaining the power of the South. So it's, you know, the, the idea has, has been around, like I, my, my own view is that I think, I think it's a good idea. I mean, I, I would prefer a national popular vote, but I think fractional proportional can work. And, and then tying that in, I'll add a couple of sentences about the, the question you posed originally. I think the answer is that a, a fractional proportional system would give some more power and influence to peeps, people in rural parts of urban states. Um, for example, upstate New York. Um, and it would do the same thing for people who live in, um, you know, in, in urban areas in largely rural states. Uh, you know, for example, Nebraska. Uh, so I, I think, you know, it, it, would, it would have different effects depending on the context. So one important point about your uh, point about the 1950 amendment and the perception of who it would benefit and who it would hurt, that was, as I think you were alluding to, that was in a context where there was massive suppression of the vote in the South. Um, and once you relax that assumption, then it's not clear it's benefiting the South in particular. No, no that's right. No, no, and that's a very important clarification because what, what emerged in the debates around 1950 was that what it would do would be to divide up the electoral vote of New York and Illinois um, and Pennsylvania um, while the South would remain solidly democratic. Uh, so, yeah. uh, but, but yes, but that's, that, that no longer being the case would no longer be the consequence. Right. David? Um, I, I'd agree with Alex's point that it it helps minorities in all kinds of states. So whether you know, the the hipster in Tulsa uh, gets to have more of a chance to influence things, even though Oklahoma as a whole is going to go one way, and the same thing for the the farmer in downstate Illinois, even though Illinois is going to be Democratic. But I, I think it's if you're actually going to go fractional rather than having one be the smallest number the fraction can be, uh, it has to have a constitutional amendment. Yes. Because our, yes, our, right, as you know, Article 2 and Article 12 and the 12th Amendment all are about individual human being electors mm -hmm. who cast one vote for president and one vote for vice president, even though you and I lost on the, in the Supreme Court on whether electors means actually people can elect and make a choice. Uh, the court still hasn't said they that they still have to be human beings. Um, right. So we, we, we need an amendment to, to fractionate the, uh, the, the score. Yeah, one would have thought, although if electors aren't electors, then maybe they don't have to be humans either. So yeah. who knows? But, um, but yes, I mean, we're, again, we're not talking about the means of bringing it about. We're just talking about whether it would be a good idea, just like with the national popular vote, would it be a good idea? Um, Norman, are there, I mean, assuming that we're going with constitutional amendment to bring something about like this about. Um, is there something you would add to how we should think about it? Yeah, uh, um, I would just add that there are kind of variations of the uh, fractional proportional uh, vote system. Um, you can have a system as, as uh, kind of contained in the briefing materials where you, you would truly have fractional votes, 27.1, uh, 36.9 uh, votes being cast by a particular state. You can also have a system that uh, keeps kind of a, a whole number and therefore comports with, um, uh, with the kind of, of uh, David's point about uh, the 12th Amendment and uh, Article 2, Section 1 requiring whole votes being cast by whole, uh, whole electors, um, uh, where you know, if a candidate wins 55% of the vote in a particular state, um, they get uh, not 55% of the electors necessarily, they get you know, uh, you know, a majority of the electors. So if it's a, a state with 13 electoral votes, they get seven of the electors uh, and the, the other candidate gets six, which may not perfectly map the, the percentages. And that, um, that's kind of a, a, another, uh, another variation um, that uh, I think would, would uh, achieve many of the same benefits that fractional proportional voting uh, would do. Yeah, it's, um, I, it's uh, an important uh, weakness of the whole vote system though, that it's not necessarily gonna change the swing state problem dramatically because you know, if you've got a state like Wyoming, which has three votes and to get from one electoral vote to two electoral votes, you've gotta get from 33% to 66%. There's no candidate who's gonna move that number in that direction. So nobody's gonna campaign in Wyoming, even though they would campaign in Wyoming if it were fractional all the way down to the fractional number. The second question about this though, I think begins to give us an opportunity to build on 
Cynthia's expertise because it's tied directly to the question of how we count these votes. Um, so the second question is, is, is a risk of a contingent election significant if fractional proportional re replaces winner take all? And one of the embedded assumptions that I think we should surface, because I think this is related to the ranked choice voting question is, you know, whether we're talking about a case where there are really just two candidates or there are a case where you've got two leading candidates and some really strong, um, or let's say a really strong, a Ross Perot like third party candidate. Um, uh, and then imagine fractional voting with, um, you know, multiple candidates. Uh, the potential for, for harm or damage or danger, I think, depends on whether it's a ranked choice system or not. So why don't we start, Cynthia, with you explaining how ranked choice, you know, just introduce the ranked choice idea to these people who've deliberated about it for a while already. But, um, and, and think about whether um, the fact of uh, fractional voting necessarily has to make it more unstable than a winner-take-all system would be. Thanks. I'm not sure that I'm in, I haven't thought through the impact of the fractionalization, so I think I'll defer that, punt that to somebody else. Um, but I would say um, the ranked choice voting process is, is pretty straightforward. You uh, say, here's my first choice, here's my second choice, here's my third choice. That, that's it from the voters' perspective. And I think that's a pretty compelling argument for a reform. It really isn't different than selecting almost anything else that we do in life, whether what it's the what we want to have for dinner or our you know, favorite sports team or whatever. People have preferences. And um, in a ranked choice voting election, uh, you get to express those preferences. And um, I think it's one of the things that is compelling to me about ranked choice voting is that uh, because people have that backup choice, um, it, it really uh, it eliminates spoiler uh, candidates and split votes, um, which enables a majority candidate to win, uh, which is, I think, um, one of those fundamentals about American democracy that we assume that we have systems that deliver majority will, but we do not. And so that's the, I would say, the central um, a challenge that ranked choice voting addresses is ensuring a majority winner um, and that the, the people whom the majority of voters prefer actually gets elected. And so it's, a, it's an efficient system in that respect. And I'll add, though I could add lots of things, but I'll try to keep my answer short. Um, I'll add that one of the, the benefits that we see emerging is that because candidates um, are campaigning for their opponent's supporters, uh, support, um, there's a built-in incentive to be more civil and to find common ground and to reach um, a, 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 a issue focused kind of a campaign where candidates are appealing to their opponents' supporters for support. And so that just changes the, the temperature of elections um, and uh, really seems to increase civility. Um, and, and I'll add, um, is being tested now in a lot of jurisdictions used in over 20 jurisdictions, two states, New York City, presidential primaries, um, state party elections for both the Democrats and the Republicans. I think that the number of cities in Utah that are going to be using ranked choice voting has, has doubled just in the last week or so. So we see a real excitement around it. And I'm sure on the top of everybody's mind is the fact that Robert's Rules of Order recommends it and the Oscars use it. So two, two good plugs for ranked choice voting. Um, Eileen, um, I think you've been thinking a little bit about like the relative stability of um, um, the fractional proportional relative to national popular vote or even the winner take all system. So at least give us the cases where you think it's more likely to create a contingent election in the house um, uh, than the current system we have right now. Yeah, and is it okay if I just spend 20 seconds explaining a contingent sure. election? Um, so I, I sat in on some of the panels and I, I the contingent election is when no uh, majority of electoral votes is reached by either candidate. And so it's not just that the House decides, it's that every state gets one vote within that decision and the District of Columbia does not get a, a voice in that. And so I think that's really important. So in 2020, if this had happened, um, 
we would have seen that um, even though the Democrats controlled a majority of seats in the House of Representatives, Republicans controlled a majority of state delegations. So very likely they would have chosen a Republican candidate to be the one who wins. And so I think that, I mean, I think overall that's a risk we need to take off the table as much as possible. I think if you don't like the fact that the person with less votes can win, you should even be more afraid of the possibility of ultimately 50 votes deciding who the next president of the United States is. Um, but you could see this happening uh, more often um, just by the nature of how close our elections are getting. And if we get down to that fractional proportional, um, we, I mean, if you're doing a constitutional amendment, you could get rid of that while you're at it, the ability to have a contingent election. Um, but, but I think overall that that's just a big risk that we need to deal with. Yeah, I mean, so the clear case where it's a very significant risk is if you imagine a third party candidate who is one of the top two candidates in a particular state. So then you've, in a sense, wasted the votes for that candidate. You know, they're not going to really matter in reaching 270. So it increases the chance that nobody gets 270. But if the top two candidates are the top two candidates in every state, um, and we adopted ranked choice voting to clean out the um, you know, the wasted votes that have gone for third party candidates that are not in the top two, then, then at least you would be picking a majority among those top two. And even if it's at a fractional level, it's not clear that there's any more significant chance you wouldn't get to 270 with anything else. But it's an important danger, dynamic, dynamic um, that could be presented if we don't, um, if, if, there is a, if there is a strong third party candidate. And I agree, if we have a if we're going to have an amendment, we might as well clean up the problem that even Mitch McConnell agrees is, is a problem. Um, okay, let's let's shift to the third question. Oh, David, please. It's not built into stone that a uh, that ranked choice and fractional voting have to end up giving all the electoral votes to one of the top two finishers. You could say that if, if the Green candidate gets ten percent in Cal in in uh, California, why shouldn't that candidate get ten percent of California's electoral votes? Right. And so the, coming in third. Right. The particular proposal we were talking about was talking about allocating between the top two, but we could have a different proposal where you allocate just fractional, just proportionally, depend, depending on how many you got. Um, absolutely. Um, okay. But let's then move to the third po uh, topic, which uh, Cynthia has helped us introduce. And I'm going to ask you the first question around this because you've just begun to talk about it a little bit more, but ranked choice voting. The reason we wanted to think about this is whether you have national popular votes or fractional proportional vote, um, ranked choice voting is an alternative for adding up the votes. Um, and it's an alternative that helps you get to a more majoritarian solution, regardless of which of those two systems you adopt. So national popular vote, you could have a similar case where there's a strong third party candidate who siphons off enough votes to mean that the actual winner is not the person pre preferred by the majority. And in, frac in fractional proportional vote, it's the same point. If you're gonna decide in a state how to allocate, you have to decide whether, as Dave just, David just suggested, the Green Party candidate should get 10% because they got 10%, or we should try to um, whittle it down to at least two so that we guarantee that we're gonna get ultimately a majority um, in the Electoral College. So that's the way in which ranked choice um, would matter in both of these proposals. The first question that came up about it is, what countries have implemented ranked choice voting a system for government leaders? And has it ever caused, well, ever caused a controversy is a big, big word, but um, what, what would be the more um, pressing controversies that we, we might see that it uh, has presented? Hmm. Uh, yes, uh, countries have used it. Australia has used it for over, um, a uh, hundred years, uh, Ireland uses it, New Zealand uses it, um, Malta, important Malta uses it. Um, uh, it's used in a range of different settings and it, like in the, um, in the city of London uses it. And um, a, a number of uh, jurisdictions use it internally, like in Canada, uh, the elections for the provincial premiers are all held with ranked choice voting um, across the board, which whatever the partisanship of those, um, those provinces are. Um, I would say I can't identify any controversies. I'll do the flip side, though it sounds like I'm being Pollyanna-ish about it. 
it's been such a part of the culture in a number of uh, countries like Ireland that they used um, hand counting uh, to do the whole country uh, ballot system, uh, paper ballots, which was really a, a triumph of participatory democracy, I would say, uh, to continue to use paper ballots and do a hand count. Um, but it has, I will say, while I'm on the topic, in case I don't get asked this question, isn't that the thing we're all supposed to do, pivot to the thing you want to say? Mm -hmm. um, there has been a marked increase in countries that use ranked choice voting in the um, in most of the countries um, in the representation of women and uh, multiple constituencies of color because of the power it gives to voters to choose candidates of choice. And so um, that's one of, I think, the really exciting things where we've seen it in use. Uh, there's a, an impact on the, um, the number of women elected and, and multiple constituencies of color as well. Um, let me lead from that. Um, do we think that it would increase the number of parties or reduce the push for multiple parties? And um, I mean, Cynthia has already said that it, would, it, it has increased the diversity of candidates. Um, we expect that to, that to work more in the United States too. Yeah, I think that's a good question. I think partly that's the context where it's uh, implemented might and the strength of whatever the communities are. Um, we see in, in Alaska and Maine, interestingly, of course, there's a, a rich tradition of, of, I hate to say third or fourth, but independent party candidates winning. Um, and I, I think that's no coincidence that, that uh, reform does well in, in states like Alaska and Maine. I, I think that there uh, would certainly be um, a change in the uh, perception of the, the third and fourth party candidates, Libertarians and Greens, for example. We saw this happening in the second district in Maine where ranked choice voting was used um, in, a, in the congressional race and the Democratic candidate was uh, able to win because he was quite frank about the fact that um, he encouraged voters to cast a vote for, um, you know, a second place vote for one of the, the smaller um, party candidates who was running. And that led to his election uh, because the, the votes of those third party candidates went to him. Um, and I think that that is important. We often, uh, I think, um, end up talking about the uh, the outcome of any election or uh, the outcome of an RCV election, but I think it also helps to change the process because candidates campaign differently and voters who may be uh, a Green Party candidate or unaffiliated or a Libertarian Party candidate um, can see that their, their vote um, is going to go to a candidate that's most preferred by them, um, but it also helps to shape the conversation. And we see that um, in countries that use um, different kinds of voting systems, proportional voting systems, and ranked choice voting uh, systems that uh, it's possible to build more of a common sense about the, what the debate should be. Green Party candidates, though they may not win, are able to influence the debate. Libertarian candidates are able to influence the debate in a way that I think provides voters with an important connection to candidates and to democracy, which I would uh, su suggest helps encourage all voters to participate in elections, no matter what their uh, party affiliation is. Alex, is there a good historical reason why this has been slow to develop in the United States compared to other democracies? Uh, that's a two-part question. One is whether there's a good historical reason, and the second is whether I know it. Um, and uh, um, there, uh, the, the simple answer is I don't know, but I'll hazard a guess. <laughs> Or, or I'll talk about something um, related, which is there was, which is the issue of, of using proportional representation, which is a related scheme. And proportional representation had a lot of backers starting in the uh, second half of the 19th century. In the middle of the 19th century, it got knocked off the rails by uh, by Reconstruction and the battles over Reconstruction. It reemerges in the 20th century. Um, you know, for example, Illinois had a very interesting cumulative proportional voting system um, in the first half of the 20th century. Proportional voting came to be associated by the political right with the emergence of left-wing regimes and was sort of got branded as a kind of, you know, in a, cold, in a Cold War fashion, it got branded as something of a socialist plot. And I think that that really took the steam out of a lot of advocates of it. But that's, 
that's a long aside to uh, on the basic question. It's, wor it's worth digging into, and I'll see what I can do, but I don't have the answer today. I mean, it's interesting. Rank choice has succeeded in flagging the fact that it's been adopted by by parties on both sides. I mean, Utah is you know strongly Republican state, and they have for a long time used ranked choice voting in party matters in the Republican Party. So there's no, it's not a communist, it's not a socialist plot. Um, yeah, no, no, it certainly isn't, and and it, and, it, and it wasn't earlier. I think, I think it might have something to do with, um, to be honest, with the dominance of the two major parties, um, and what and the two major parties wanting to protect themselves against incursions by small parties. Eileen, yes, did you? And, uh, oh, sorry. Yeah. I was just going to add one of the fun facts about New York City is that Adam Clayton Powell was first elected under the proportional representation scheme. I like that term, Alex. I'm going to start adopting the scheme. Um, the first woman was elected to the New York City Council under uh, under ranked choice voting, uh, Genevieve Verrill in 1934. Um, and the the first uh, well, first people of color were elected in a number of cities, and that did upset the. The party regime. But just to underscore Alex's point, um, it, not only is it used in uh, the Republican Party is going to use it, for example, to select their um, nominee in Virginia um, just next month and used in Utah, but it's used by military and overseas voters as well, because it's just a frankly efficient and fairer way to make sure if you're serving overseas, uh, either in the military or um, in the State Department, you actually get to cast a vote for a backup in case your first choice uh, drops out. So it's interesting to see the um, arenas where it really has caught hold. Mm -hmm. Eileen, did you want to add something? Yeah, and I think just generally election reform is a little bit slower to evolve in America because of the fact of how different the laws are. So all 50 states plus DC have different laws. We have different ways of governing our primary elections as well as the general election when we pick the president. And so I think as a result of that, you don't have a lot of that natural uh, ebb and flow of people realizing, oh, well, this works and let's keep advocating for it. It's just something that I think gets in the way of that larger change. David. And Colorado was actually the first jurisdiction in the United States to adopt this with uh, in, in the city of Grand Junction in 1909. And then among other Colorado jurisdictions, Colorado, uh, sorry, Denver uh, adopted it in the 1910s and then later abandoned it uh, towards the end of the 1930s. And, you know, I, I don't, it didn't, it, it worked out okay, but I don't think anybody said it was great. We got, uh, it led to among other things, uh, the election of Benjamin Stapleton as mayor of Denver, who was a, uh, a, a big Klan guy and he got put over the top uh, in the, the third choice. I think one clear benefit is you're gonna have more third plus parties with, with high, higher top line totals on, on the, the, the round one selection, which will improve ballot access for those parties and elections going forward, because they'll be able to cr cross over that, say, 10% threshold uh, to be able to get on the ballot in the next election without needing to do it by petition. On the other hand, it might actually reduce how much candidates try to appeal to the supporters of those third parties, because if you're, say, a Democrat, you can say, well, that's fine. Everybody can vote green if you want to, and then just I'll, I'll take for granted all of those green votes going to me on uh, as preference number two, and sort of similarly for the Republicans and Libertarians. On the other hand, if you only can cast one vote, then the candidate who wants the votes of, of voters whose heart is with the Greens or the Libertarians or whatever, really has to come at them and say, this is gonna be your one vote and you've gotta give it to me. And even though I'm not perfect, I really am a, a lot closer to you. And so the candidate would have to to work more to earn uh, the votes of those, at least in, in some ways, of those third party minded uh, uh, voters. Okay, so we're coming to close to the end. I wanna make sure that we get one more question um, for each of you. Um, um, and the question suggested, um, uh, the perfect question for this is, um, of all of these alternatives or proposals, which choice do you think will lessen polarization within politics as a whole today and why? Um, so let's just go around and you can say what you want in response to this or anything else you want to add. Um, and then I've got like 10 seconds I've got to do at the end. So let's try to keep it uh, brief. So let's go. In the, um, Alex, why don't you start off? I, I think that um, either a national popular vote or a fractional proportional system um, 
may have the effect of lessening uh, polarization and ranked choice voting as a mechanism of reducing polarization might well achieve the same thing. But frankly, I'm not sure that these change, you know, I think that the forces behind the polarization that we're dealing with right now are sufficiently powerful and I think external to the electoral system that I'm not sure they will have much impact. It's a great point. Cynthia? Yeah, I agree with Alex that um, there are so many ingredients in the polarization that it would be foolish to think that just one change is somehow going to undo something that's been building, you know, since the beginning of the country, really, in, in essence. Um, but I do think the um, that ranked choice voting does uh, address that. And so it's it's one of the ingredients that I think help, that would help to uh, to reduce the polarization um, just in the, the process of being able to rank a candidate second, third, et cetera. OK, David? I, I'd agree that the, the polarization has lots of reasons that have nothing to do with the electoral college, the presidential election setup, um, and it is not going to go away. I might suggest that the current system is could be better than any other in terms of at least tamping down polarization to some degree to the extent it forces candidates to try to win in the swing states, uh, which by definition are the more uh, ideologically uh, diverse and balanced. So I, I just want to flag an assumption that you, you made this point a couple times, and I think it's important to surface an assumption behind it. I mean, there's one way to think about a swing state as if everybody in the state was a moderate. Right. But a state like Wisconsin is not a state filled with moderates. You've got a bunch of very conservative people and a bunch of very liberal people. And so when you try to win Wisconsin, you're trying to win the base. And so it's not, it's not necessarily the case that appealing to the swing states is to appeal to the moderate vote. Is it? Is it uh, agreed, it's not necessarily too. And, and you can look at the 2004 election where both sides, even though there were swing states, their campaigns were very much focused on, on base turnout in, yeah. in say, Ohio. Uh, but at the same time, you know, there are those swing vote suburban moms who live in some of these states like Ohio and, and Pennsylvania. So e even with a, a, a base focused election, you still have to be able to, yeah. to go get those, uh, those moderate voters to take you over the top. In a that was very important this time. Okay, um, Eileen? I agree with Cynthia and Alex that there are a lot of things that we need to address polarization in this country, and a lot of that can be done through these types of election reforms. Um, I personally support ranked choice voting uh, as well. Uh, you know, I'm advocating it for a lot of our different levels of government. Absolutely. Um, when we come, when it comes to the current way that we elect the president. We would never go from where we are now if we had, you know, look at your U.S. Senate races. If we have whoever gets the most vote wins, we would never go back to a winner take all system like we have for the Electoral College. And so I think at a minimum, we have to move forward to a national popular vote just to make people really feel that they have a voice in the system. Because if you don't have an equal voice in selecting the only office that represents all of us, are you really going to be that motivated to participate in the system at large and fix all of the other things? I don't think so. Great. Uh, Norman. Uh, I, I agree with uh, Cynthia uh, and, and David, and I guess everyone, that ranked choice voting is uh, the best of the three in terms of its potential for maybe reducing polarization. Um, but let me just take the flip side of that question. Uh, so what, which of the three is the worst in terms of exacerbating polarization? And let me say it would be a national popular vote, even if done by a constitutional amendment. Um, modern campaigns uh, um, basically uh, demonize the other party as a way to motivate their base and get their base uh, to turn out. And so with a national popular uh, vote, it would just incentivize the, the two parties uh, to be quite frankly more extreme uh, in their caricature of the, the opposite uh, party because that's the way to, to drive out your voters or drive your voters out to the polls uh, in San Francisco uh, or the suburbs of Birmingham, Alabama. Okay, um, there's still a lot more to discuss, but um, I'm really grateful uh, to the panelists, incredibly grateful to the, I wanna call them just students, but the 18 to 29 year olds um, um, who have participated today. Um, and it's my job to also remind you to come back tomorrow for the next round of deliberation, which is not gonna be around the Electoral College, but. Um, um, it's still important for this process. Um, and then we'll be doing a final survey 
after that deliberation. But thank you again to the panelists so much for participating and, um, and enjoy the evening.